It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 356 of Science on Top. Today's Tuesday, the 14th of April, 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello, Ed. And Penny. And the reason you can hear us yammering on about science is thanks to all the generous donations from our Patreon supporters. The few beloved angels who have gone to scienceontop.com slash donate and helped contribute to the costs of running the show. You only get charged when we release an episode and you can put a limit on how much you donate per month. We're very grateful to all those angels who have contributed. But let's begin now with reproduction. And when it comes to giving birth in the animal world, there's really only two main options. Either you lay eggs or you pop out live babies. It's really one or the other, but very, very rarely it can be both. So Penny, tell us about Saphos Aqualis or the yellow-bellied three-toed skink, as a lizard is perhaps better known. Yes, so like Ed said, we usually think of laying eggs or giving birth to live young as sort of a dichotomy, you know, and obviously there's some famous kind of exceptions, but we even use that as a way of classifying whole groups of animals. Like, for example, birds lay eggs, reptiles lay eggs, Mammals give birth to live young, but then we've all heard of the monotremes, the platypus and the echidna, which are mammals that lay eggs. And we can see, we've seen lots of examples of species that kind of defy that kind of classification. But this skink is really interesting because like Ed said, it's really, really rare. There's six and a half, over six and a half thousand different species of lizard. So that's a lot of that's known over the world. That's quite a few different species of lizards. But only three of them can lay eggs and give live birth. So these are two of these species are in Australia. And they're really interesting because they give us a bit of a hint about how live birth might have evolved. And the thought is that this has live birth has probably evolved fairly recently. In these skinks. So mammals, for example, have been doing it for millions and millions and millions of years. It might not have been quite so long for these particular lizards. And it's not just that the species themselves can do either. Even a single individual in a same litter has laid eggs and given birth to a live baby. Wow. So what on earth is going on? Because let me tell you, much as I would have loved to have reproduced by laying an egg... <laughs> you know that's not an option like humans do not have we can't grow a shell we Mm. just don't have the genetic kind of capability or the physiological capability of doing that you know we're very very committed to the whole life birth route (laughs) for better or worse whereas these skinks can and what I thought was really interesting about this is thinking about the mechanism by which an organism can change from one to the other and why one single lizard can either have a live birth baby or lay an egg. And it's to do with the gene expression in the uterus. So obviously all these lizards or these skinks in the same species have the same basic set of genes. Like, you know, you have different variations. Obviously they're not clones of each other, but it's not like one of them has a whole extra chromosome for this is how you lay an egg. So there's genetic changes that happen in the uterus of the skink. So there's only a couple when it's going to be laying an egg, but when it's holding a baby or developing a baby in there, then there's thousands of different genetic changes. So genes that are switched on and working that wouldn't usually be switched on and working. And what they found is when with the lizards, Esequalis, when they're giving birth to a live baby, you do see those thousands of genetic changes just as you'd expect. But also, interestingly, if you look at ones that are laying an egg and they're not going to look after the live baby, um, you see a lot of those changes happening anyway. 
And some of them allow the embryos to develop within the mother for a long time. So it's interesting because this seems to be kind of a recent development. You can see how maybe, you know, having an egg for longer and longer and longer and these kind of changes to do with the expression of genes could happen but can also be reversed because it's not about having an extra organ or doing something completely different. It's um, switching off and on certain genes. And it's really interesting to see that the these skinks that are laying eggs are expressing genes in their uterus really similar to ones to lizards that give live births, which might be why this lady lizard could give birth to a live young and lay eggs in the same pregnancy quite horrific really if you think of it <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah so it's really really fascinating because it's the kind of thing you think oh all these things just evolved so far in the past it's not happening now we'll never see it we'll never understand it yeah and of course you can't say oh this is happening to these particular skinks this is what happened to the ancestral reptile mammal thing you know millions and millions of years ago. But it's that whole intelligent design mm. thing of, well, you've never seen evolution happen, have you? Yeah. Well, Well, often we do actually. And this is a perfect example of it. Here it is. Here it is. Like, um, yeah, so I just thought this was fascinating. My understanding is that um, everything started off with eggs and Mm. evolutionary eggs came before live birth sort of things. Like we lost the ability to generate that hard shell and we stopped producing eggs or delivering eggs first. Um, so this, yeah, it does suggest, doesn't it, that it's an intermediate step between one and the other. Mm. Or maybe it's going to be like this forever. Who knows? Yeah, like flick back and forth. Why not? Now, Lucas, one of the things most people would understand about solar power is that it really doesn't work great if there's no sunlight. So how can two American researchers be developing prototype solar panels that work at night? It seems counterintuitive. It is. It it absolutely is counterintuitive. And funnily enough, the physics are exactly the same, but just the opposite. Um, (laughs) They're the exact same, but opposite. (laughs) Well, in terms of reversed in in, Uh in the way that you you collect the, the, you know, the, the current. So... The reason uh, photovoltaic cells work is there is a big differential. Um, so as, as sunlight falls upon the cells, um, the, there's a, a energy being you know falling on those cells where there wasn't previously, and as a result, the, there's this um, the, these cells allow current to, to travel you know across the, the cell, and then you you have uh, arrays that pick up all of that energy and you pull it together and that's basically you know all the process is that's working you're just collecting you're collecting the energy that falls upon the cell now that energy uh in that case is is predominantly uh, heat and light so uh, sorry it's heat and visible light so it's infrared and visible light falling on those cells there's a, a big differential and you you start to get current flowing with anything it's all about differential. In fact, there was another story that I almost selected for uh, for doing in this one, which was related, where scientists have developed a technology from uh, a type of bio nanotech that allows them to collect energy from the air um, just from doing nothing. Of course, the, the amounts of energy collected are so small, it's nothing really useful right now. But all this team have done is they've said, well, what is the difference between day and night? Obviously, you've got uh, during the day you've got sun, you know, sunlight, got all this energy from the sun hitting every square meter of the earth that's exposed to the sun. Uh, so during that daylight time, the earth itself is collecting all of this energy, is storing this energy in, in terms of th- right. thermal storage. Okay. Now during the night, when you haven't got the sun, you end up with the earth radiating away all of this energy back out into space. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is taken advantage of exactly that. So using a different type of cell, they've been able to build these solar cells that that generate about a quarter of the energy um, by radiating back into space, a quarter of the energy of, of their you know comparable solar cells during the day. Now, 
This, considering as a first prototype, a first generation, to already being, be able to generate a quarter of the amount of energy as solar cells during the day, that to me is huge. That's, That's right. significant because yeah. if you think of how long solar panels have been along around, mm. the, the time that it's taken us, it's taken us, um, what, 50, 50 Fifty plus years, I would say, by now of, of solar technology. Yeah. How long have we had them on satellites? I mean, yeah. maybe we're getting up to sixty odd years that we've been using them, and obviously they're they're quite ubiquitous now. They're everywhere. But to have a pro, a prototype that uses the reverse process that already collects up to a quarter of the the energy in the same time for the same space is incredible. Now, the other thing that was very interesting about this was, of course, you know, you, your requirement here is that you have uh, open space. So if you're in, say, for example, if you, you were to set these things up in an island of heat, so, so cities are a, a, a good example of this, um, if, you, if, if the cells are surrounded by a lot of ambient temperature around the same, um, that could be a problem, especially if there's anything that's blocking their view of the sky. So that it's the differential, remember, that's important. So if the differential is still significant, it wouldn't matter if they were in a desert that got up into the, you know, 70 plus degrees on the surface during the day. It wouldn't matter at all, as long as they have a nice big view of the sky. But if you put them in a, in a city or something like that, and there's, um, there's overhang or there's trees above them and that sort of thing, then you're reducing the differential. So the, the, the other, um, cool part about it though is they don't, strictly need night time to work either they just need that differential to work so even during the day if they were in shade and there was a differential between heat that had been already collected by them say for example in the morning they collected heat by being exposed to sunlight during the afternoon if they were in shade they would start to radiate that heat back off just think if you've ever walked on a you know on a road after it's been baked by the sun for, for a lot of the day, especially if you're wearing, you know, no shoes, playing cricket. Back in the days when we used to be able to leave our house, <laughs> do you remember what that was like? Oh, fake. Um, <laughs> um, what is this sunlight thing they talk about? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so that, that heat from the road, of course, radiates back out. And, it, and it, because there's so much stored heat there, it doesn't matter that it's still a warm afternoon. You can feel it just you know, hitting you as, and, and burning your feet. Um, so again, it, it, it just requires that differential. So to my mind, I think this is going to be a much bigger deal than, than solar cells. If, you, if you've ever spoken to anyone about installing solar cells at your property and you have trees, mm. now I, as you know, Ed, I live in an area where we really only have trees. I mean, it's trees and rain, that's, they're the, really the, the overwhelming <laughs> things that we have, that nature gives us here. Um, we end up with, you know, although we've got quite a large roof, at any given time of the day, any piece of that roof receives direct sunlight for probably about an hour tops, hmm. um, you know, because of the trees on either side of the house. You know, we only get really limited. And uh, because of the way the solar cells work is... Um, if you if you have an array of cells that are set up, if any of those cells are partially obscured, the amount of um, uh, energy that they collect drops incredibly yeah. fast. Yeah. So um, so that that's a, you know very problematic. Now this process, by contrast, could actually work extremely well for us because although you know the sun is a is a point of light across the sky, and as a result you get these moving shadows throughout the day. Of a night, we've got you know. We've got a, a great swathe of sky mm. right above the house, mm. which is exposed the whole night. Nothing, you know, unless, you know, a massive bat <laughs> would hover. There's really nothing, you know, obscuring it. Um, don't know why I thought bat. No. But, uh, uh, there's that's really nothing. Can. There's nothing much that's going to obscure that. And it gets freaking cold, um, you know, exposed to that uh, sky as well. So I think the application of this is extremely exciting. Um, as I say, considering, I, I wouldn't have been surprised to read, say, you know, the initial prototypes were delivering something like, you know, uh, one sixteenth of what we're getting out of, you know, solar equivalents right now. But to already be at a quarter, I, I find that just astounding. So as I say, what's not known yet, because the details are very, very scant about, uh, about this, is exactly what the, um, the materials are. 
So that they they were very uh, you know I've I've seen uh, an article on Earth Sky and there was an interview given um, by one of the lead scientists who developing these cells. Both of those uh, pieces of information were very scant. There is a paper which I've not been able to access yet. I will, uh, I will gain access to that paper and uh, and come back to you it's the last as a, thing as a I follow do. up. <laughs> if it's the last thing I do, come back to you as a follow up because I'm very excited and I'm I'm just I'm kind of I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall uh, and sort of what's the catch? The biggest problem being Cops. yeah. Now un- unfortunately they're made of unobtainium <laughs> um, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I suspect that's where and, we're at at the moment. It's just the cost is going to be the biggest barrier to getting right, them now. And, and as long as the materials, yeah, as long as the materials are, are not absurd, as long as they're common materials, and as long as the process isn't absurd, so if the process takes, you know, many, many hours of things to be put together uh, or... Um, or Harvesting uh, rare polar bears or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, as opposed to the common ones, we don't... They'll be fine. We can go with it. So, yeah. So, basically, that, that's the thing I'm waiting to see is what the actual uh, materials are and what the process is. I will report back when I hear more because uh, I think this could be a much bigger deal than the news coverage that's had yeah, um, uh, would suggest. Yeah. Well, as you say, uh, solar panels have had 50, 60 years to develop, and this is at a very, very early stage of, I don't even know what we're going to call this, radiant panels or something. Mm. Um but yeah. still, a quarter of the energy of a solar panel, most of our energy consumption is, you know, late afternoon, evening. Uh, you don't need a lot of power to get you through the night for a lot of people. So, you know, right. it could be... that's right, exactly. We don't need to get to the same parity uh, in terms of production. No, that's exactly right. Because you, you're, not, you're not trying to cram it into such a short period of time. And as you say, this is when... But certainly it might also be an answer to the, to the problem of, you know, one of the biggest issues with renewables is constantly the criticism that, you know, they only work yeah. when, the, when yeah. the thing is, is happening, whether it's wind or when it's solar or it's wave energy or it's, well, I guess thermo, thermo and hydro are pretty reliable as long as there's water and, uh, and heat inside the earth. I don't think that's going anywhere soon. Um, they do actually have a name, by the way. They're the thermoradiative cells, thermoradiative cells. Um, so it's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue very well, though. I was close, I think they need something Radiant better. Animals. Yeah, just thermo cells, I reckon. Or thermal maybe cell. Maybe catch on a little bit better. Um, the other thing I wasn't um, clear of, though, is you kept saying that you needed a wide open view of the sky. I'm not sure why that needs, because don't you just need it to be hot during the day or whatever so they warm up, and then as it cools overnight, that difference would... So, so you don't need a wide open view of the sky, but it the, helps in the, warming it up. the less obstructed it is, the better. And even that only matters if your differential is affected by other things. Right. So um, the principle of the things is to use space as a giant heat sink, effectively. And space is really good at that because it's really freaking cold. So, um, so if you've got an open sky, then if you've ever, you know, laid on the beach at night under a sky, you the the you can feel, you know, all of the heat being sucked out of your body, um, unless it's a hot night, obviously. Um, and and that's, you know, that's that's really down to the the sky above you. But if it's a cloudy cloudy night, um, yeah. that's you know less so. You know, the cloud sort of has a more insulating effect. Yeah. yeah. So so it's it's really just about the differential, and and uh, it doesn't need a great big open swathe of sky, but certainly that you know the more the better. So basically, if you live in a cloudy uh, area then solar panels and these panels are not going to suit you mm-hmm. <laughs> so much because they're going to be yeah, the yeah, enemy yeah. either way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, hopefully you've got some wind or something. Not you, personally. <laughs> um, Thank you for your concern. <laughs> no, very cool. I, I love it when you get these, you know, or on the cusp of something revolutionary in technology like that. It's always exciting. Yeah, yeah, and as I said, I was a little surprised not to find a lot more coverage about this one. Yeah, because um, you know I, I do tend to look out for energy things, and obviously batteries are one of the big, you know, holy grails of tech mm. uh, in our in our era. Because you know we can generate power all sorts of ways with with um, with renewables, but storing of it is the is a bigger is the big problem. Sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this... but yeah. If we can do it at night and day with with you know the same physics but in reverse, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you're right. This story's flown under the radar quite a lot because I mean the paper was published in January 
of this year. Right. And we're only getting it to it. I think this article came out end of March, and we're talking about it in April. So. Right. Yeah. It's been on your your sheets of, of ones for you know for a few months. Uh, it's probably a, a COVID nineteen <laughs> casualty. Possibly. What isn't? Mm. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about how to train your dog, shall we, Penny? And as we all know, mimicry is a very common and effective teaching technique. So how is Google teaching robot dogs? This is a machine learning story. And I often am not attracted to these stories, but this one I was because it was a dog. It's dogs. <laughs> it's a dog. <laughs> and I particularly like the little animation of the dog trotting backwards um, or just seeing the dog. But it's very creepy looking robot dog. It's not quite what I imagined when I clicked on the clickbait headline. <laughs> Um, if, I would, if you've seen the Boston Dynamics dogs, it looks yeah, very similar to those ones. Very it's a um, Google project. Real um, platonic, not even a platonic ideal of a dog, like a real skeletal kind of dog. But um, apparently, the Boston Dynamics dog, which can do some amazing things, like it can do a backflip, it can climb on uneven ground. It's all been coded, so painstaking lines of code and instruction. But the Google dog has been taught in a different way. So this one has been taught by motion capture and machine learning. So what happens is the um, engineers got motion capture videos from a public data set. They fed that into a simulator to create a digital version of the dog and then trained it and put that into a physical robot. So the way it works with machine learning is... um, the algorithm that runs it sort of generates a move. If it's close to desired move, it gets a little yay, like you'd train your dog. Like if you say sit and it kind of puts its bum vaguely downwards, you're like, yay. And if it's not, it gets a no. So the more that it's, and then it it chocks that information away and modifies its algorithm the next time. So even though it's learning all these moves, it's not being written down and programmed so it has a bit more flexibility in terms of what's it's learning um it's not directly copying the dog it's trying to find a way its own way of doing it i shouldn't say it's trying to find that's not the right kind of language but you know the algorithm a robot now (laughs) i am anthropomorphizing it's like it's so easy to do but um yeah so It basically, over these many iterations, it gets closer and closer and closer to the desired movement. And then once it can do that in the simulator, you then transfer that into the real world. So this is pretty cool. Like walking like a dog is not an easy thing to do, even on a flat surface. And the fact that it was taught to do that without a person there saying, you know, this is exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah, because the other alternative is you code every little thing that you need to do, you know. Have your sensor yeah. detect if the ground changes like this and how much pressure to apply at each time and all that. But this is, it's learning it all by itself. It is learning it all by itself. And it also means, like, because of the data sets they got, it's learning some things that real dogs don't do. So some of the dog motion was actually animations of a little dog dancing. <laughs> and the dog learned to do that as well. So, so I need to see that video yeah. <laughs> of the dog But dancing. it's really it's really interesting because um, if you think about it, like just say we did have our own little robots in our homes, I mean no engineer is going to know every single thing about my home and what I will do and what I will want that robot to do and respond to. They have to be able to learn to some degree and you can't expect every end user to become an expert robot coder. Mm-hmm. So this machine learning, I guess, is, you know, mimicking the way that animals learn, that people learn, and hopefully yeah. we'll come up with more flexible kind of programs and, um, you know, a library of movements probably that could be programmed in the basics. Like not every robot dog needs to learn to walk from scratch. But, you know, just say these were going to be guide dogs or something, I'm sure that a guide dog in the country would need to learn different things to a city dog. So. It's, it's fascinating. Machine learning and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Two of your favourite things. Yeah. <laughs> or at least one. <laughs> at least one. I, I have to say I'm a cat person, but I guess like, I don't know. 
what would the what would be the point? Even I have to admit the point of a robot cat. <laughs> 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 for me, to it's going to be easy to code, out. though, wouldn't it? Like, you just have it ignore you. Yeah, and then yeah. glare sometimes. Just teach it how to push things off tables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. And it just has to do that and look cute. And then yeah. you've nailed it. Nailed oh, it right there. I know. But it's funny, when you're talking about the Boston Dynamic dogs walking before, mm. have you seen the videos of, of them kicking the dogs, like to try and make them fall over? Yeah. Oh. You feel so bad for them, oh. even though they're robots. <laughs> It's like it's so cruel because you, you, you have this, well, I don't know, I you know, you, you start thinking of them as dogs because yeah, they, they move. So, yeah, yeah. And seeing them kick them, it's like, you bastard. But, you know, they're, it's a robot. You, yeah. Oh, I'm sure I read some um, Asimov story where his, one of his robot stories, Isaac Asimov, where one of the, Susan Kelvin, you know, the really ultra cool, logical robot researcher, so, had a robot bug I think that like beeped and twittered and acted like it was alive and right. she had to stomp on it yeah oh For some what she reason. had to stomp on it because oh, it was just, oh, okay. I wish I could remember oh. the story I don't know Perhaps it was, I need it was it one of the short stories it was I'm sure it was one of the I short might have stories it. yeah and uh, but like, might, I'll have a look but she was quite it. surprised because she's like of course it's just a robot it's not alive I don't have any feelings about mm. this but yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah. going to be that part of you in the back of your mind that goes, like, yeah, oh, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> like maybe I'm just an algorithm too. <laughs> but that's a genuine thing that we actually do need to think about is as robots and I mean, it's even happening now with, um, you know, your Amazon Echoes and your Google Homes and everything where we talk to them, we interact with them on a somewhat personal level. Mm. Uh, we need to think about how we're going to respond to our our robot vacuum cleaners when they start behaving and misbehaving or whatever <laughs> all of this is actually going to be a thing that's going to need to be looked into how we treat our robot mm. slaves um, and the boston dynamics thing is interesting too because of course google did buy boston dynamics back in 2013 and then sold that them. was for their um that was to, to help with their AI, wasn't it, for their cars or the, uh, the self-driving car? I'm not sure because it was bought by X, which then became part of Alphabet, which is now the umbrella company that owns Google and right. a bunch of other things. Um, right, right. I'm not sure what they were planning on using it for, but I think it's interesting that now they've gone, well, we're going to make robot dogs too, <laughs> but we're going a different yeah. pathway because a lot of the Boston Dynamic stuff is hard-coded, how to walk and how to judge on uneven surfaces and things. Whereas Google's like, just watch dogs doing it, man. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's very cool. As you say, dogs and machine learning, what's not to love? Yeah. Mm. Which brings us to the end of our show. And as always, we'll put all the links to the stories we just talked about in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 356. And if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can help contribute and help us make the show. Thanks a lot, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Uh, now, a roaming robo-dog has been patrolling parks in Singapore over the weekend to help curb coronavirus infections. Far from barking orders, the four-legged machine has been politely asking Singaporeans to practice social distancing. But it's wise not to ignore the puppy, as breaching Singapore's strict rules can result in hefty fines and even jail. That wow. is no puppy. That is no, no puppy. puppy. Man, it gives me the creeps. <laughs> They'll be taking over the world soon. You watch. Uh, Starts with dogs, then it's humanoids, and you know Black Mirror. Yeah. So I've, I'm getting an education this morning on Here Black Mirror. Look at it. No, terrifying. Um, you, th you, you think they're nice and kind, and docile. <laughs> then this happens, no. and it's over. Singapore can keep them for, for the mankind. moment. It's gone.